Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Deed. It's, it is an honor and a privilege for me to share the word. It's an honor and privilege for me to serve uh, under Pastor Deed and Pastor Amy and, and all the staff that, that serve here at Real Life Church. It's just, it's really a, a, a pure joy. I want to just tell you real quick, in the lobby today, we have a table with some of our Urban Ministry Institute materials there for you to look at and review. And there's also a, a, a pad there, a sign-up sheet. If you would like to consider being a part of our next uh, class, uh, which starts, it's the first week of September, uh, you can put your name there, put your contact information. We'll get in contact with you and uh, tell you how to register. Now, the beautiful thing about Tubi, like I said, there's 16 modules, but you, we're going to start back at module one in September, but the beautiful thing about the program is you could, you could join at any time because each module is self-contained. So if you come in at 12, for instance, you could go right around through 16 and then back around to, to through 11 and complete the course. And uh, so we just welcome you. Uh, we'd love to have you a part of the class. Today, I want to uh, continue with this series. It's been a powerful series so far. The paintings that Mikey Spencer has created for us are just, are just so expressive and so beautiful. And we have another one today, and it's my privilege to share the story of the woman who touched the, the hem, the, the very bottom of Jesus' robe, and was instantly healed. And I want to recount that from Luke, the eighth chapter, beginning in the middle of the 42nd verse where it says, as Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately the bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Now, we're not just talking because it's the summertime and we have a cute phrase, summer of miracles. Because, but I believe my heart today and the heart of all of the speakers of this series is to challenge you, as my title is, to live a miracle life. I believe every believer in Jesus Christ is entitled and privileged to live a miracle life. Now, we have this woman depicted in the painting who the Bible tells us had spent all that she had. She'd gone to every doctor in that part of the country, every specialist that she knew about, and when it was done, she was still seriously ill with a physical ailment. Now, some of you have been there, or you've seen others that have gone through it, but they go everywhere. They spend everything they have, and they end up hopeless. And we cannot expect man to do what only God could do. But if you don't believe in miracles, where does that leave you? It leaves you hopeless. And that's where the subject of our story found herself. The fact is that no man has the power of life and death. And even more importantly, no man has the power to cleanse from sin and make us clean. Only the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of God through the Holy Spirit Making us to be born again could do that. We have to get to Jesus. But then she heard that Jesus was coming through Capernaum in her area. And suddenly a spark rose within her heart. This great one, this rabbi who has the power to heal, the one who's performing miracles of healing and deliverance everywhere he goes, maybe, just maybe, if I could get to him, if only. So she plans her mission carefully to the best of her ability. She waits in the shadows, unseen, unnoticed, until Jesus walks by. Oh, by the crowds, people everywhere, thronging him and surrounding him. 
How will she ever break through to touch him? She's weak. She's sick. And at that day and time was considered unclean. Will they stone her for even trying? But with even one touch publicly, she could cause others to become unclean. So many questions, but only one hope, only one answer. She has to try at all costs. She begins to push and shove her way to break through the crowd. Oh, up above, below, down below, worming her way through the crowd. I'm sure she felt like a lot of you have in the middle of a big crowd before, maybe in a ball game, when everybody gets up to leave at the same time when the opposing player hits that grand slam. <laughs> they all head to the doors. But the crowd was there, but she kept going. She didn't give up. Her very life depended upon the one, this one single act of faith, it had to happen. She finally reached out, and the Bible says she touched the hem only of his garment, and she was instantly healed. Now, this is the story. But I want you to take a few moments with me today and look inside the story to see what the real story inside the story is all about, and what the message is to your life and to my life today. A powerful spiritual truth is here, so it, it wants to impact our lives. One of the big messages that I will leave with you today is embodied in the theme of the title of my message, Life. Because I honestly believe that every Christian believer is called to live a miracle life. You, that means you, yes, you. Now, there's four distinct things that I want to talk about today, leave with you. But before I get into those, I want to give you the preface of those four things and why they fit together and why they make sense. Because we need to understand that the Bible, the Scripture, gives us many patterns and principles to follow and to live by. You see, God is a God of order. He's a God of pattern. You need to look no further than the creation to understand how God fits everything together. Now today, early this morning, earlier this time of year than in December by and large, the sun came up really early. And this evening, later than December, the sun will set. And tomorrow morning, if Jesus has to come back, the sun will rise. And all the yesterdays of your life, the sun rose and the sun set and the seasons came and the patterns were set because God is a God of order. God's word, the scriptures, sets forth many patterns as well. So maybe you've wondered, for instance, why it is that when we begin our services, we sing and we worship the Lord. We clap our hands. We lift our hands. Why? Because the Bible tells us to do all those things. Those are all contained in the Bible and in scripture. But why do we always do that at the beginning of our gatherings, of our services? Is it to wake you up? You know, I told this 9 o'clock crowd, you know, they're, the, they're the, the tough ones for Christ. I said, maybe it's, you know, to get you awake and you're still a little asleep and haven't had your coffee yet, your Starbucks, your Dutch Bros, and you need to get, get a jolt. Is that why we do that singing? Is that why we praise our hands? I mean, clap our hands in the first part of the service? No. You go all the way back to the early part of the Old Testament, to some of the most thrilling books of the Bible, you know, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I mean, they, I mean, you talk about reading those for your morning devotionals, or you want to go out of your house every day shouting, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. You know, no, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. But interwoven against all that lineage, which is important, by the way, our patterns and principles that the Lord gave to us. Now, when Israel was in bondage in Egypt, God said one day, I'm going to free my people. And through the leadership of Moses, they were set free, and they began to travel from Egypt towards the promised land. They were in the wilderness, in the desert. You can go there, visit there today in that part of the country. It's very arid and dry. And they were traveling. And the Bible indicates to us by uh, reasoning and counting, we can figure out there was more than a million people. And they didn't all rush to the door at once. You, if they would have, you'd know what would happen. But God set up order and plans and patterns for them to follow. And so they were divided into 12 tribes according to their birth lineage. 
and each tribe was given a name as to as a a uh, a person that was prominent, the, per, the person who was the head of that tribe in the beginning. And one of the tribes was named Judah. And God said to Moses, when you march in the wilderness, the tribe of Judah is to go first. Now, is it because, you know, they were God's favorites? No. It's because Judah, the word Judah, the spiritual meaning of the word Judah means praise. And so praise was to precede everything. And so God told the tribe of Judah, when you begin to march through the wilderness, and they did this ongoing, 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 when you begin to lead them, you are to proclaim the mercy of the Lord endures forever. The Lord is great. The mercy of the Lord endures forever. They would proclaim that on and on. They would lead that chant. They would lead that praise. And praise would precede the people of God as they marched in the wilderness. Well, guess what? When they got the promised land, one of the things they heard from the people who were living in the promised land, who were the enemies of Israel, is they said, we've heard about your God. We've heard how powerful he is. How did they know about that? Because there was Judah going first. Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. It was a thunderous, thunderous. They didn't have sound systems in those days. Thunderous sound that took place as God's people led in praise. And so we look to this passage of Scripture, and we see similar patterns that the Lord gives us in understanding how to live a miracle life. And I want to look at four of them with you. Number one is this. Slab the door on doubt. Slab the door on doubt. Now, I could have said, and I thought about this a lot, I could have said, shut the door on doubt. But the more I thought about it over the last several weeks, I thought, no, no, I like the emphasis of that word slab. Because we all know what it's like when a husband gets upset and slabs the door, or a wife gets upset and slabs the door, or a teenager gets upset and slabs the door. You know, it, it gives an emphasis, doesn't it? it it's, it's beyond just shutting the door. We, we don't mildly walk out of the room when we're upset and shut the door. We walk out of the room, we slam the door. I hope they heard that as the whole house rattles. 3.0 earthquake. And that's what you need to do to your doubt. And that's what this lady, I believe, did. Because she was probably filled with a lot of doubt. If you're going to live a miracle life, you've got to slab that door. Uh, this lady, I believe, had lots of doubts. She had a lot of self-doubt, but somewhere, somehow, down inside of her, she just knew, if I could just touch the very hem of his robe, I will be healed. So how does this happen? How do we slab the door on doubt? Well, i got to tell you, it all starts with faith. And so many times we think we do not have any. Why don't I give you a verse? You've heard it before, probably. It's not in your notes, but it's a powerful verse. It's found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Hebrews 11, 6 says, but without faith, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he, talking about us, who comes to God, must believe that he, our Lord, is. Now, here's a key. And that he is a rewarder, rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Without faith, you can't please God, friends. But with faith, he starts giving out the rewards of those who seek after him. He pours on the rewards as you seek after him more and more and more. He increases your faith. You say, I want to, I'm a candidate. I want my faith to increase. Next verse, Romans 10, verse 17. So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more you hear of this book, the Bible, God's word, the more faith comes into your life. Why could a guy like Baluli, who he doesn't, he doesn't mind me talking about him because he's my dear brother, who spent 36 years, four months incarcerated in prison, why could that man be so full of the power of God and the joy of the Lord, a deacon in his church, a leader in his church, getting ready to start a tomb in his church? Why could that happen? The Word of God came to him, and he has devoted himself these last years to these studies, and he has had faith increase, 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 increase in his life. 
because he's gotten in and heard the word. I got someone like on down here who battled cancer, and we gathered around her in class numerous because of the power of God. Faith comes by hearing, by hearing the word of God, hearing the word of God. So if you want more faith, <laughs> guess what? Guess what? Get filled with the word. Buy yourself some CDs with the word. Listen to the word. Read the word. Meditate on the word. Get in the word. Get in a Tubi class. Get into the word. <laughs> <laughs> Sit here every Sunday. Hear Pastor Deed. Bring the word. Be here Wednesday night. Bring, hear the word. Your faith will soar. It's the promise of God's word. He does it. Now, the next verse is a real key. It has a lot to do with what you say. This lady, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Your tongue, my tongue. The Bible says with, with our tongues we speak life or we speak death. It's amazing. It really is, but it's true. It's a principle of God's word. And so the more you begin to speak life, and the best thing is, like in the previous verse, get more and more and more of the word in you because you're speaking the word, you're reciting the word, you're claiming the word, you're breathing and living the word because faith is growing in you. What's going to come out of your mouth is going to be the word. It's going to be faith rather than death. I like life a whole lot better than death. I don't know about you. Several years back, Doris and I became pastors of a church. <laughs> like I said before, I'm not going to tell where or what the name of the church is. But when we became pastors there, I never had encountered Pastor Dean, such a negative group of people in my life. Honest, true, Christian people, Christian people. Oh, it was bad. And I wanted, God, why am I here? Why did you send me here? And every, every week, one of my kids, yeah, Jocelyn, she's here this morning. One of my kids... Or my wife would say, when are we moving back to California from this state? And it was miserable. And then the Lord began to speak to me and began to tell me to speak life to them. And so I began to do a whole series, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. That's when we had, well, that's when we had Wednesday night church and Sunday night church. You remember those days. And we began to speak the life. And all of a sudden, the people began to catch it. And they went around speaking life to people. And it was exciting. During the midst of all that, a little lady of our church, she was short, older, and she was blonde hair. I think she had a little help with the blonde. But uh, <laughs> but she was diagnosed with a very serious advanced stage of cancer. And we believed and we prayed and we said, Betty, uh, we believe God's going to heal you. And she said, I believe God's going to heal you. Pastor, I've just taken this to heart. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. I believe God's going to heal you. And so we went to the hospital. The doctors were, had done all the tests. And now they're coming in to give her the final diagnosis. She was the only one that I know of in her family that was a Christian believer. Her husband, her children, her, her uh, grandchildren, none of them followed the Lord and knew the Lord. And there was a whole bunch of them in the hospital room. And the doctor came in and he gave this message of doom and how terrible it was. So they weren't really able to do anything for Betty because of the advanced stage of cancer. I got to tell you, I stood there and I knew the Lord wanted to heal her. But she began to listen to her family and listen to the doctor. I literally saw, honestly, I just as if it happened five minutes ago, I can still see it this gray pall that went over her face as she began to agree with them and say, yeah, I guess it's hopeless. I just got to prepare. And four months later, I conducted her funeral at our church. I believe and will believe till the day I'm in heaven and ask Jesus, I believe the Lord wanted to heal her, but they began to speak death to her. Rather, That's how serious that is and how important that is. And if you want to move and live in a miracle life, God would maybe change your speech just a little bit and fill it with the word of God. Just might mention that there. Amen. Slab the door on doubt. Because doubt doesn't come of the Lord. Second point, 
They get faster as we go along. Number two, step into an atmosphere of faith. Step into an atmosphere of faith. That's what this lady depicted here did. Because you read in the preceding verses of our text, going back from the 8th chapter into the 7th chapter, there we see Jesus healing the centurion's servant. Then we see him. The winds and the waves obey him. And the next story, the, the demon-filled man is freed and delivered from demonic spirits. Why did the crowds throng around Jesus when this lady came on our mission, her mission to touch the very bottom of his garment? Because they were there because they had either witnessed or heard of the miracle power of God through Jesus Christ. Atmosphere of faith, you've got to move into it. I've been in the atmosphere of faith. Many of you have been. We're in the middle of a room that is filled with the atmosphere of faith today. We're here. As a young boy, I attended a Oral Roberts crusade. And I was, oh, I'm telling you, I was wide-eyed because I saw people throw away crutches. I saw th people throw away braces. I saw people in wheelchairs jump up and start running and running all around that big, big, big evangelistic tent. I saw miracles happen before my eyes. Talk about an atmosphere of faith. Then as I was a young man, I would go to the Oakland Coliseum, Oracle Coliseum, and I would be there gathered with hundred, with tens of thousands of people watching the ministry, healing ministry of Catherine Kuhlman. And Catherine Kuhlman was an awesome, awesome evangelist, powerful preacher. Oh, man, talk about an atmosphere of faith. You know why? Because that, that gathering began with about an hour of worship. And the power of God would fill that coliseum. And the miracles of God would begin happening before ever Catherine Kuhlman appeared on the platform. And then about an hour in, she'd come sweeping with her long, flowing white gowns onto the platform. And she would grab the microphone and she would say, have you been waiting for me? And the first time I heard that, I thought, that's a little bit over the top. And then I read about her life story and discovered that as a young girl and as a teenager and early adult years, she had been a terrible, terrible stutterer. And the way that she was able to overcome stuttering was to talk slowly. And that was her style. She would preach the word following that hour of worship, and then she would begin to lay hands on the sick, and the miracles would continue, and awesome things would happen. You've got to slab the door on doubt. Now, I know there's people who will set around and say, you know, there was people there faking it. Or, you know, that evangelist that came, that, you know, he laid his hands up and then he pushed them and they fell down. And you could get caught up in all those things and guess what? You'll be filled with doubt and the atmosphere of faith will be dissipated. But you can choose to say, you know what? I really don't care. <laughs> I'm going to choose to believe that the Lord moves and I choose to believe that Jesus heals, and I'm going to accept it by faith. And if they're, yes, and if they're faking it, God will deal with them, and that's not my job. That's not my job. You know, for instance, Catherine Kuhlman, uh, in her ministry, when we started out in ministry in, in La Jolla, California, as, as part-time youth pastors, a lady attended our church, and uh, her name was Mary Helen. And Mary Helen was the receptionist to a world-renowned osteopath who had her offices in La Jolla. It was, La Jolla is a very prestigious place still to this day. And people would come from around the world to be treated by this doctor. This doctor was not a Christian believer. In fact, to be honest with you, she was part of what we probably would call a cult. But every time Catherine Kuhlman came to the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles, every six weeks, and held a Sunday afternoon evening crusade, the Shrine Auditorium, this doctor would be sitting back you know, on the, towards the back of the platform, and when people who had certain ailments came across and claimed that they were healed, she would examine them and look at their medical records and offer confirmation to the best of her ability that these people had been touched and had been healed. Because Catherine Kuhlman 
wanted it to be genuine because it's the power of the Lord. Now, several years ago, Doris and I were pastoring a church in San Jose. And I got word from my mother that she was going in for some serious surgery and I needed to go to Oregon and to spend some time with her and help her as she got out of the hospital. I was going to miss a Sunday at our church. When we were youth pastors in those days in La Jolla, just starting out in ministry, God gave us these that we found in the scripture that says if you have faith even as small as the grain of mustard seed, was this little elderly couple, John and Mary Ann. John was retired, and Mary Ann had been sick and had health problems most of her adult life. And every morning, just before service started, John would wheel her in, in her wheelchair, and they would set back there. She would set outside the aisle. He would set on the first seat in the very back row. Every Sunday, they were there. And that Sunday, when I had to miss it, Bill was ministering at the end of the service. He just began to have people worship. He wasn't praying for people around front. Nobody was laying hands on people. And all of a sudden, Mary Ann got up out of her wheelchair and began to walk towards the front. She got about to from the third row to the front, and one of my elders and his wife were standing there worshiping the Lord. And our elder looked and said, Sister, is the Lord healing you? And with tears coming down her cheeks, she said yes and walked all the way to the front. And people gathered around her and prayed for her. Mary Ann passed away about five or six years later. And every day from that Sunday morning on to the moment she passed away, she was never back to that wheelchair ever again. Every Sunday she'd come walking and marching into church because there was an atmosphere of faith. Thirdly, have a strong determination. Have a strong determination. You know, there's nothing wrong with a little bit or a whole lot of grit. You know, I just, that's the best way I could describe this, a whole lot of grit and determination. And you know something? I believe God honors that. This lady worked her way through the crowds. The, the, the crowd was, it was so packed together, it was stifling. It was so hard for her to get through that crowd. Stifling crowds can be very imitating. Sometimes people faint. Sometimes they, they get claustrophobic. When I was a young guy just starting out at Bible College in Eugene, Oregon, I had a part-time job at the, at the First National Bank of Oregon downtown Eugene. And uh, one day on my lunch hour, uh, I went outside, and then I remembered, because I heard the noise of a huge crowd, I remembered that they were having a political rally in what was called the park blocks, where the government city hall was and so forth, kind of catacorn across the street. And there was this huge crowd, huge crowd over there, because Robert Kennedy was there addressing the crowd because the Oregon primary was just in a few days. And so I thought, well, well I'm going to go over there and just see if I can see him up on the platform and be able to tell everybody I saw Robert, Robert Kennedy. And so I went over there, and I missed it. The speech was over. The whole program was over. I missed everything. And everybody's kind of milling around. I mean, you're talking like, like packed in like sardines like this. And so I'm just standing there. I thought, well, I'll just walk back over to my office and get back to work. And like just before I could turn a leaf, all of a sudden, these security guys came through, and they just, they were almost like Moses. They parted the Red Sea. And it, about a four or five foot swath in the crowd, and I looked up, and there is Robert Kennedy. And I instinctively stuck my hand out, and he reached and shook my hand. And I couldn't believe it. First of all, I thought he's a lot shorter than I thought he was. <laughs> I thought, man, he has a lot more red hair, because those days, most TV was color TV, uh, not color TV. And he had these red freckles all over his face. And I thought, you know, I'd have never known that if I'd never seen him in person. The crowd was one moment like this, and the next moment there's Senator Kennedy. I'm shaking his hand. Gave that big Kennedy smile with all those teeth showing. It, I mean, I just wow, couldn't believe it. Walked back over to the office and said, guess who I just shook hands with? Who? Robert Kennedy. Wow, fantastic. Because the crowd moved aside. Now, the crowd didn't move aside when this happened until it happened. But all of a sudden, people found out what was going on. It got the attention of everybody, and everybody knew what the Lord had done. Last point. Reach out with every ounce of strength to touch Jesus. 
That's what this woman did. She used every ounce of strength that she had to get there. If I could only get there, if I could only touch Jesus, if I could only touch him. Some years ago, the church I was pastoring, we were privileged to have the evangelist Sean Smith speaking on a Sunday morning. And we'd had a great time of worship. And many of you know Sean Smith, powerful minister of God. We had a big crowd that morning, full house. And we had been worshiping. God's presence was there. And I introduced him to come up to minister. And he came up and took the microphone from me. And he, instead of saying, you know, I'm really glad to be here this morning. And it's great. Your pastor's great. All those things that they say a lot of times. He said, while we were worshiping, the Lord spoke to me. He said, there's a lady here this morning, the best I can describe it, has an issue of blood. And right now, the Lord is healing you. And then he said, that's not all. He went over to the other side of the podium, but he said, by the way, there's a gentleman here who's just been diagnosed with a serious heart condition. And the Lord, this woman, is healing you. And you know what? After the service, I met both of those people. The lady with the issue of blood and her husband, it was the first time they were in our church that day. The man with a heart problem had been diagnosed with a very serious heart problem. He and his wife was the first time in our church that day. Uh, guess what? They were back the next Sunday, this following Sunday, following Sunday. God healed them both instantly. The issue of blood was God. That lady's husband said, I've had her taken in the last two weeks. She's been in the hospital three times in the ambulance because of her terrible bleeding, and it was totally gone. I'm still, in touch, I'm still in touch with those people today. Got a, uh, uh, a message on Messenger this week from the husband. Just touch a base with me. They, they live in another state now. He's, and they're leading a great miracle ministry themselves because God touched and healed. You see, that's how it happens. you got to have that strong determination to press through the crowds. What's keeping you from receiving what God has for you? You know that the Lord has it for you. Will you just push things aside? Will you get rid of that doubt? Slam the door on it. Get yourself in an atmosphere of faith. It doesn't have to be in a church service like this or a great arena or there's a miracle crusade going on. It could be right in your living room. It could be in your automobile driving down the road. It could be as you're standing in line at Rayleigh's or at the DMV. <laughs> the Lord could touch you. The Holy Spirit could break out. You could receive your healing, your miracle right there. If you just help in the creation of the atmosphere of faith, it begins to take place. You've got to have that strong determination, that grit to move forward and then reach for every ounce of strength you have. Touch Jesus. Touch Jesus. He is the miracle worker. I can't do it. Oral Roberts couldn't do it. Catherine Kuhlman couldn't do it in and of themselves. It's Jesus who does the work, and it's Jesus who performs the miracle. Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet with me this morning? I'm going to let the graduates leave at this moment. They're going to stand out in the lobby and receive your congratulations in just a few moments. But we're going to worship. We're going to sing that last chorus we sang. It's such a faith-filled song. And I believe that the prayer team members are going to come forward. If you want prayer this morning, if you want a miracle this morning, you come forward and let them pray with you. And I believe in the next few moments, miracles are going to take place. And we're going to hear about them in the next few days and weeks and months that are going to take place in this service right now. I, you know, I knew in the first service that the Lord was going to do some great things. But as I was sitting here while worship was going on, before I came to the platform, the Lord just quickened my spirit some things that God wants to do today in you. And so the Lord will speak to you. He'll make it clear that you were the maybe one of the ones that God wants to work in. I'm not going to call out any names or any conditions or situations. That's not the setting for that right now. But I know the Lord will speak as he's spoken to me many times and many of you as well. It's going to happen. So let's have the prayer team to come and let's begin to worship the Lord just before we dismiss. I know we're a little late, but uh, they'll hold the lunch for you. Amen. Amen. I believe in you, you're the God of miracles, I believe in you, oh yeah, I believe in you, you're 
the God of miracles. He wants you to live a miracle life. In the name of Jesus, I proclaim it. Be blessed this week. May the Lord keep you and bless you. Remember, no service this Wednesday night. Back next Sunday for 9 and 11 o'clock. Love one another as you go out. Check out our Tubi information. Greet our graduates. Love one another. God bless you.